What's up, guys? It's KB. Make sure you subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Click the bell icon down below so you don't miss a single video from us. And thanks for tuning in to another video from Underground Sports Philadelphia. Now let's get into it. Philadelphia, baby. You're going to love it. Best sports fans in the world. Actually the worst, but that's what makes them the best. Welcome back to Top Bins, the show bringing you all the action from the Premier League in Serie A, England, and Italy. I'm your host, Matt, joined by my co-host, Dom. Dom, how are you? Good, man. Good, man. And I'm just counting down the days of the weekend, not because I'm looking forward to any uh, <laughs> any soccer games, but we have a pretty big trip we have planned, so. You know. Yeah, it's really Should cool. To talk about that. Dom, uh, Dom is taking me away for my birthday weekend. Really nice of him. Just uh, stay. Hey, up listen, guy. listen, man. <laughs> All right. He said, "Hey, man, I know it's your birthday, so I figured I'd take you to Myrtle Beach. Uh, we we'll just exactly. hang out, exactly. Just meet you, some of the boys, you know, just have a uh, have a grand adult time. We are we're sandwiched <laughs> between a wedding and a bachelor weekend, so uh, we are. <laughs> I'm running on E this week. I'll be honest. I." Uh, I'm yes. loading up on body armor and like Z packs because I am just I am torched. It has been a long summer for the boy, and I am just I am feeling it this week. We need uh, that uh that liquid IV, brother. I've been pounding we need that liquid sponsorship. IVs. I have been doing. I, please, liquid IV, because you're a little pricey. I gotta say, um, for just uh like that sugar dust that you get when you go to the aquarium on a school trip. Uh, like, let's be real. Today, uh, we're, we're talking, you know, because uh, Premier League will be back not this weekend, but next weekend. So next week, you can look forward to a Premier League preview episode. Um, but, you know, this is in the spirit, I think, of sort of a preview for the season. And, and we'll be dipping a little bit into the Premier League and Serie A as well with this. And these are regression candidates for the season, some teams or some players to look out for. Regression is not always necessarily a negative thing. You get a positive regression where someone or a team was expected to get more points or score more goals or not allow as many goals and you know for whatever reason individual player performances personnel issues l bad luck it did not happen and so you expect that maybe they will regress to the mean the average or closer to the average at least than where they were um we had a few hey, outliers professor matt professor yeah, you know, uh, I, matt, mean, matt mean median mode i get around i know what i'm talking yeah. about uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's another way I think of looking at the season that was and, you know, how that might, uh, change this year and maybe how some of these teams have looked to address some of these issues, right? Maybe some of these underperformances. The first one we're going to talk about, which is, I think a great segue into some of the ways the team has gone out to address this Manchester United scored 56 goals last year, but that was on 67.7 expected goals. Uh, so a pretty sizable underperformance by about 11 goals. Um, you could honestly put this to a, a few different things, right? Not having that estab established number nine uh, was definitely an issue. Now, you did have Marcus Rashford's like hot scoring streak for, uh, you know, like the middle uh, chunk of the season, and that really coincided with United's best form. Uh, he did cool off a little bit on either side of those things, but, you know, on the whole, uh, Manchester United really could have used a, a really legitimate number nine last year. You know, Vic Horst was just not that guy for them, unfortunately. Um, they've gone out and, uh, and addressed that. You know, they, they signed Rasim Solian. Um, 75 million euros could go up to 85 million euros with Atalanta, uh, who are just the best at turning around players for profit, uh, maybe in all of Europe at this moment. Um, certainly in Italy, I think they're the, the best club at just uh, running prospects through and, and getting good fees. But They've gone out and tried to address this. They've gone out and tried to address. Now, I will say with XG and, and things like that, they're going to be, you expect that the great players will overperform their XG, right? So this is important to understand for the rest of the episode too. You know, players like Harry Kane, Lionel Messi, Erling Holland, Cristiano Ronaldo, Mohamed Salah, Robert Lewandowski, they are almost always going to outperform their expected goal tally, right? Uh, it's not uncommon for them to go six or seven above uh, maybe you know, where they were. And that's because they are well above average finishers. These are guys that just score very well. So keep that in mind too, as we talk about these numbers, these are not concrete. These are not live and die by these, but I think they're good benchmarks to kind of understand where, where a team was in Manchester United did underperform in the goals department last year. It did affect their season and they've gone out now and, and clearly tried to address that. Yeah. I mean, uh, have they addressed it any other way other than Hoyland? 
I haven't been paying attention to their like transfer news. So, so they're they're trying to get uh, Amrabat from Fiorentina. They've got uh, Onana from uh, you know Inter Milan, of course, uh, as their goalkeeper. Um, I think they're in the market for some center backs still, looking at a defender. But um, it's really kind of all the holes that you had in the squad. They've been looking to address. Uh, Holian's interesting. You know, we, we we can talk a little bit about that because. Obviously, we we had mentioned him a few times during the season, especially uh, around January when he started to really break out with Atalanta. He's an interesting, I would say, very like toolsy striker at the moment. Not someone that is by any means polished. Uh, this was really his first uh, appearance last year in a top European league, and he did, I would say, good. Uh, he was not he didn't blow people away. I wouldn't say he wasn't amazing, but I, I think people have been a little harsh on his performances. Um, there was some inconsistency there, sure, but I, you would expect that from most 19 and 20 year olds, uh, you know, in their kind of debut season. But I think we did see him uh, really dominate in a few games, and he has shown like the the raw physical traits that he has, and that those could be really elite. Uh, and you know. You have a lot of time still to round out his game. One thing that I like about Tim, too, is he's, he's comfortable dropping back and receiving the ball. Um, that could be huge for Manchester United and how they want to play, but he's also can be a very direct striker. He's got incredible speed. It is going to be interesting. You know, Premier League, I would say, is a a step up in defender athleticism compared to Serie A. Uh, you know, a lot of the Serie A defenders um, are a little bit slower, maybe not as physically imposing. Um, maybe on a technical level, might be uh, better in some aspects than Premier League defenders, but... Um, you know, if he's going to be really like chasing down some of these top, top guys, uh, you know, we'll see about that. You know, that's, that's going to be a, a big challenge for him. But again, it is a way that United have, have looked to address their issues from last season. No, I, I, I think it's very, uh, I have seen one thing and it's the very lazy uh, Hoyland versus Holland, you know, uh, battle that's going to be coming this season. Everybody's like, oh, watch out. Is the Premier League ready? I don't, I don't think Hoyland's at that level just yet. You know, Holland like, was was levels above, uh, yeah, and that's so, no so far. disrespect to Hoyland because Holland was one of the best striker prospects I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the first time I saw him play for Salzburg, I was like, this guy's unbelievable. Like mm -hmm. he went to Dortmund, and I was like, he's just gonna he's gonna tear Bundesliga apart. And he did, and he did the same when he came to the Premier League. So yeah. um, comparing anyone to him is always gonna be a little fair. It is. You're right. It's a little lazy. It's they're so they're lazy. taller. I think it's really they're taller. Uh, like faster, faster North European and blonde uh, <laughs> men. That's kind of just where it ends, though. Um, you know, one's Danish, one's Norwegian. I don't know. Yeah, there, there's they're both countries I wouldn't mind living in. Tell you that much. Denmark sounds great. I'd love to live in Denmark, but um, outside of that, I, I I don't see that there's really much to to compare between no. the two. Let's look at another potential regression candidate for this season, also in the goals scored department. Chelsea scored 37 goals last year, which is a shocking number when you consider uh, the money that they've spent, not just last year, but in years past, and kind of the talent that you expect to have at their disposal. Uh, but that was on 49.5 expected goals. So again, a, a pretty sizable underperformance there uh, for Chelsea. They've looked to address this as well, of course. Part of that, I think, is clearing out some of the uh, the deadwood that they've had. But they've got uh, Nicholas Jackson, of course, uh, one of their big signings. They had Christopher Nkuku already kind of in the pipeline. Uh, you know, they had a deal reached last year, which became uh, valid for this summer. So he's coming over. You know, so they, they have uh, they have made attempts to again, you know, try and find a more established number nine. They even did during the season, you know, they get Obama Yang uh, and hope that he could kind of find some finishing form and just wasn't able to do so. Um, but yeah, you know, this was part, of, I think, of the the bad summer, you know, the, the bad year, I should say, uh, you know, for for Chelsea uh, was this pretty serious underperformance and and lack of, of goal scored, lack of finishing kind of polish. And, you know, it, it led to, you know, a Jal Felix emergency loan, right? Uh, you know, in the hopes that he could kind of jumpstart them. And it just never really got there. So you hope with a, you know, a full summer. And again, some of the transfers that they've made that, you know, they'll, they'll find a way to improve on this. Um, but, you know, I... <laughs> It's still a team that I'm very curious to see uh, this season. Pochettino certainly has his work cut out for him, but uh, you know, I, I think there is clearly room for improvement there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> anything will be a positive for them, right? They 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 just severely underperformed last year, and it, I'm, I looked up Chelsea transfer news just to just to see if they were 
doing anything to, to help them with this, even though, you know, they're already strapped for cash with all of the, the contracts they've already promised. But there was something, something talking here about uh, Mbappe saying that he wanted to sign for a Premier League club and uh, Chelsea would be the, the, the place to go, but only if they match like his one request, which is like pay him a ridiculous amount of money for one year, like a one year contract. So he can decide if he like wants to stay there or not. That would be uh, that would be one way to to close the gap between your expected goals and actual goals is to sign one of the best strikers uh, in the world. That would definitely do it for you for sure. Um, yeah, the Mbappe stuff is interesting because uh, the conclusion there is going to be bizarre uh, because PSG are sort of withholding him from no. the tour and from training with the first team, of course. So uh, I'm I'm very curious to see how that gets resolved if Madrid just end up swooping in and and paying some kind of price to get him now rather than just waiting for a free transfer. If he does some sort of loan, maybe to somewhere in the Premier League for a year, uh, it's a study abroad year. <laughs> does something like that who knows uh it's it's gonna be fascinating to see where he ends up oh. another regression candidate i can say confidently this team will not be signing killing mbappe in uh in any way i don't even think they'll be signing ethan mbappe at any point um <laughs> everton 32 goals scored last season on 45.2 expected goals uh pretty serious underperformance here uh this is this is getting even beyond just that but you know maybe there's a little noise there you know um now this is uh clearly you know you would expect with the goal with the chances that they had that they should have scored this number of goals with an average striker um they they fell well below that bar and that's not surprising uh, if you watch them uh you know we talked all the time about how damari gray was their leading scorer and uh you know, it's Damari Gray. <laughs> he's, uh, you know, I, I like the guy, but he's not, uh, he's not the guy, let's say. Um, you know, a, a team that is definitely missing, you know, Dominic Calvert-Lewin and uh, sort of his, his better form, his better days. Um, but, you know, I, I think the thing that would make me at least excited or at the very least hopeful for this season if I'm Everton fan is looking at that expected goals number. You were creating chances. You know, this wasn't a team that was devoid of ideas here. Um and you look at what a difference, you know, even if you get eight goals better, you know, uh, what a, a stronger position that puts you at in the league. Um, now, as far as addressing that, uh, <laughs> they got Dan Juma, uh, who they originally wanted. Um, I will see. He did, not, uh, he did not impress all that much with Spurs, although he obviously didn't get a ton of uh, playing time with Spurs. Um but yeah, largely speaking, they've really not gone out and signed anyone. You know, it's always hard for them too because obviously they do have some uh, some financial constraints. But um, yeah, I think they're going to hope that Calvert Loon maybe stays uh, stays healthy. You know, this year um, they loaned L Sims back out. You know, he was a striker that they were maybe hoping could uh, could pick up a little vein of form and, and start to develop. Uh, it just it, it never really happened for him in the Premier League last year. Mm -hmm. So very curious where the goals are going to come from from Everton. That seems like it could be a a big sore spot for them. Every other team we've talked about so far has at least gone out and made uh, some kind of signing. Uh, Denjuma is not, to me, very inspiring. No, not at all. Uh, you're expecting a winger to, to kind of spur the goal scoring. I mean, you have he has to have somebody to help him out there or else in the, in the Premier League, it's very easy to defend a team like that. I mean, like before this whole Newcastle revival, that's essentially what Newcastle was with, with just Alan St. Maximin on the wing. So like, it's they they need to they need to bolster the team in other areas as well to help them out because if if other teams are holding the possession numbers in their favor and and, and are just constantly putting pressure on your team and you don't have any other options other than are not Dan Juma to like get the ball up the field and get a goal scoring opportunity it's not looking good. Uh, it, what's what's interesting to me is that they were only expected four less goals than Chelsea. And even Who then they only bigger? scored five. The, well, this is the crazy thing is like Everton was fighting for relegation, but if they scored five more goals, they're equal with Chelsea on the season. That's crazy well, to think about. This. Chelsea weren't far off from relegation. Well, yeah, <laughs> we were, I remember us talking about that on the show. They were not far off from getting sucked into that whirlpool. So um, it's a good reminder of just uh, how bad Chelsea were last year that uh, you know, <laughs> they were putting up kind of relegation numbers on the uh, the goal scoring side, especially. Let's talk a little bit about goals allowed because we did have some extreme over and under performers last year on that front in the Premier League. Spurs, 
63 goals allowed, but on 49.7 expected goals against. So Yikes. that's about a, what, almost a, a about a 13 uh, goal swing there. Um, more than, than what you would have expected them to actually concede. Uh, part of this could definitely be a Hugo Lloris uh, indictment. He definitely had a little bit of a drop-off last year, and uh, it was a little more than a little bit, uh, which <laughs> explains, obviously, their interest in replacing him. Um, yeah, you know, and I, I think, too, you know, one of the, the biggest targets for, for Spurs this summer as well is finding defenders. Um, it seems like they're, they're going to be reaching a deal to get Mickey Van de Ven in, which is a good signing, but they could use, honestly, like two more center backs uh, because they are definitely hurting in that department. Um, I don't know what the uh, the plan exactly is with, with goalkeeper with them. Um, I, I, I'm curious to see, you know, if anything happens. You know, David Raya, of course, is, uh, is being offered to, I think, a lot of teams um, from Brentford, and he had a good year last year. I think that could be a potential option for them, so... Um, we'll see where, where, where Spurs go with that, uh, but clearly, you know, defensively and, and, and goals allowed, uh, you know, a big, big area of improvement for Spurs uh, for last year. There's a reason why teams like Brighton and Villa finished above them. You know, it, it, you allow that many goals. It, it, you don't deserve to be any higher. <laughs> I mean, not a single team above them allowed that many goals and only a few teams, even teams below them. Tottenham are, are lucky not to be even lower on the table. They just scored enough goals to, you know, give them a couple easy favors. They like had a Harry Kane 30 goal season. Uh, yeah. Like it, it, they are very lucky for this man. <laughs> no wonder, you know, you have this whole transfer saga going on with him because he obviously wants out. He sees what happens and, you know, he's, he's got the team on his back almost. It's, it's, concerning for them i would not even say almost he has the team on his back fully all the time <laughs> uh, we'll stay in london as we talk about fulham who had uh, 53 goals allowed uh, but this was on 63.8 expected goals allowed so they had almost say a 10 goal swing almost an 11 goal swing on the opposite end where they actually uh, probably should, could have should have and could have conceded uh, quite a few more than uh than what they ended up actually doing uh, Burn Leno had a really nice season last year, but you know we've seen this in years past. We saw this with Wolves, uh, not this past season, obviously, but the year before, um, that they also had an overperformance and, and they sort of uh, found back their level uh, this past season in terms of goalkeeping and goals allowed. And so you can kind of expect or project that Fulham might do something similar this year. Um, you know, in a, in a lot of areas, I think you can expect regression from Fulham this season. You know, I, they lose Mitrovic. I don't know that Raul Jimenez is exactly the right replacement there. Um, I don't know that you're going to get quite that performance you got out of Willian. We'll see. Uh, but, you know, when you look at just some of these these numbers, if you look at these, uh, you know, potential like goals allowed regression here, this could be a team that is not comfortably uh, mid-table. This could be a team that is maybe on the lower end, maybe fighting relegation. It, it would depend a lot on, uh, you know, what kind of goal production they can get out of this team. But um, Fulham are definitely on my on my must-watch list for in terms of uh, performances this year because it could be a, a, a sour season for them. Yeah. I mean, we were all – I mean, I think you, you were talking to me when we were previewing last season about Fulham. You know, you wouldn't be surprised that, you know – the team, because I think you said statistically the team that won the championship like has a very good chance of staying in the league, right? And and I think that we see have seen them almost overperform in terms of expectations. So it wouldn't be a surprise to me if they're kind of fighting in that relegation bubble, like sort of like Everton did this this past year. So uh, it's an uh, I don't know. I still think they're in a better spot than than some of these teams have finished below them where they, they they could not be comfortable per se but uh not the worst team in terms of being in a relegation battle next year you know they yeah, kind of sit in that like 12 13 14 place yeah they, they could be uh maybe just outside the zone but um again you know the Premier league if you're not moving forward you're moving backwards you know mm -hmm. That is definitely the, the vibe that you get from this league. And Fulham have not done all that much in terms of uh, transfers so far. You know, uh, like we, we mentioned, uh, Raul Jimenez. But uh, they got Calvin Bassey, uh, the center back uh, from Ajax, 
uh, that's an interesting uh, addition there. Um, but yeah, not, not a ton there. You know, they're just going to rely on, I think, Burn Leno at the back. Totally deserved to, based off uh, based off past seasons. Um, you know, and he obviously had a, a just, like I said, a great year uh, coming from Arsenal and looking to prove himself and, and was able to do so. So, How much uh, money did they get for Mitrovic? I, I think it was some – I don't even think it's actually completed yet, like officially, but I think the fee that they were looking at was somewhere in the 40s. Um, you know, that was obviously the issue with a lot of these Saudi Arabian clubs is they want to offer these players – really high wages and make all these promises and yet when it comes time to deal with the clubs it has not always worked exactly that uh, you know they're they're willing to <laughs> to pay an appropriate amount for that player but um it does seem like Mitrovic is on his way to Saudi Arabia it's it's more about figuring out the price uh, which I think Fulham are looking to get into that that 40s maybe low 50s range well you know once they it, it almost seems like their outlook on the season is very reliant on getting this deal through so they can maybe alloc like allocate that money made from the transfer to make a couple signings. But it seems like their whole like transfer saga is, is very reliant on this right now. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we'll look at some individuals from the Premier League before we move over to Syria. Um, these, these two are interesting to me because they had obviously such great seasons and Listen, there's, again, great players overperform their expected goals uh, uh, pretty pretty regularly. So this doesn't necessarily mean anything. But you know, if we talk about some regression stuff, you know, Arsenal did have a uh, higher XG. Um, I'm sorry, a lower XG than goals that they actually scored. Uh, you know, they, they definitely outperformed in that way. But again, when you have a team of good players, you typically do kind of outperform your XG. It's not totally uncommon, not totally unheard of. Martin Odegaard, 15 goals on 10 expected goals. Um, and Gabriel Martinelli, 15 goals on 9.3 expected goals. Um, if they're even just around at their, you know, their lower, their lower kind of end there, you know, maybe the, the season looks a little bit different. Um, if sands or butts, though, you know, you know how it is. But again, if you're just looking for, for places for regression to come, um, Arsenal did have a very, very hot start to the season. Um, Odegaard was great all throughout. I, I think Odegaard is absolutely the real deal. And I also think Gabriel Martinelli is absolutely the real deal. This is not, uh, I'm not trying to push any kind of narrative, but, you know, maybe we don't see in the, the mid teens for them. Maybe they are actually more 10 goal season players, 11 goal season players. I think Martinelli can reach higher numbers. I'm not sure that Odegaard is going to be giving you 15, 16 every year. Like, I don't know that that's actually his level, um, uh, of goal scoring, but, uh, yeah, something to think about, I think, if you're Arsenal. Is that in the end? They clearly have. You know, they, they bring Rice, I think, balance out the midfield a little bit more, maybe provide a little more stability, uh, take uh, some of the work, or allow Odegaard even more freedom in the final third. Uh, Kai Havertz as well, uh, another addition. So, you know, we'll see uh, We'll see how the Arsenal season goes as they try and uh, avoid sort of a, a sophomore slump, if you will. I think that they have a lot of weapons, though. So I think, like, looking at XG in, in the case of Arsenal, especially bringing in a guy like Havertz, who's also going to be expected to score a lot of goals for the team, and you obviously have Bukayo Saka on the right. So, like, I I feel like depending on what players you pick, right, you're going to find certain guys that are, you know, supposed to be goal scorers for Arsenal who are underperforming their XG of the season, and you're also going to see some guys who are overperforming. Um so I wouldn't be surprised if, like, let's say Martinelli, you know, tails off and, and, and has, like, a slump compared to this last season. But, you know, who knows? Uh, Havertz may be overperforming. You know what I mean? So I, I feel like it's just because of the makeup of Arsenal. They have so many options that, you know, the wealth will be spread unless they're just, like, one damn good team. And in that case, you'll see everybody over, the, you know, their XG probably. Um, like you said, it's no surprise, like, if it's – if it's – you know, good players play above their expected goals, but like that's the only way I could potentially see like Arsenal being like that team is if everybody's overperforming. I think that you know you'll have some guys who do, some guys who don't. It's tough to kind of just pick and choose where we think that may happen. With a young team like they have, you know, you can expect year on year to to make big improvements and strides. Mm -hmm. um, or at least that's the hope. And so they could, you know, we we could see. Uh, those expected numbers even climb a little bit and, uh, you know, they find their level again. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how Arsenal perform this season because they've made some big bets this summer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they've, they've pushed some chips in. 
Uh, yeah. Fair enough, because you know when you, when you had uh, as as good of a season as they had, and you come up a little short, uh, yeah, I think it's fair to try and reinvest and and go again. So mm-hmm. uh, you love to see it. The other uh, very interesting uh, regression candidate from the Premier League already ties in with the team that we've already talked about um, and a way that they've tried to address this. Bruno Fernandes, eight assists on seventeen point two expected assists. Um, that would have uh, obviously seen him as one of the the best assisters in the league, if not the best assister in the league, how close he actually got to that number. But again, I think this just ties into what we're talking about with them not really having, outside of Rashford, a reliable goal scorer. Um, and, you know, that obviously Bruno Fernandes can still create a lot for his, uh, for his teammates and that uh, maybe last year was just a little bit unlucky for him in that department. You know, he's clearly still creating a lot of big chances, uh, you know, putting his teammates in good positions to score, and it just did not work out that mm-hmm. way. So, you know, maybe Hoyland makes uh, makes some better f- uh, finishing choices or, you know, just uh, luck of the bounce, luck of the draw kind of goes uh, Bruno's way this year, and uh, he has a more fruitful season because he's obviously a very creative player. We know that, especially because he's on set-piece duty a lot too. Um, that's always going to help with uh, with expected numbers, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty pretty stark underperformance there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's weird because it seems like he was one of United's better players this season, but I guess, like you said, he didn't have a reliable goal scorer in front of him aside from Rashford. So, it, we'll see if he can turn it around. Uh, it's it. I love the United fanboys who. We talk about these dumb and lazy comparisons, you know, all the comparisons you hear of him to De Bruyne and how close he is to De Bruyne or he's clear of De Bruyne. Like it's, it's so, it's so stupid. Like imagine, imagine what everybody would be saying if Kevin De Bruyne had this uh, regression, if, if he underperformed this severely, like be the end of the world. Like this is, this is normal. I mean, they have to bolster the team around him for in order for him to like play as the player like we kind of know of him from the last like few years. Yeah. So that's uh that's what we got for the Premier League. We'll hop over to Italy where not as much in terms of uh big regression candidates, you know, this again, I, I was trying to pick teams that were more than just, you know, three to five away because, you know, Again, I think that's kind of normal variance. You kind of expect there to be a little mm-hmm. noise with expected numbers. Um, I wanted to find teams that were a little bit more on the extreme end where you could really expect maybe uh, a difference this year, maybe a few players too. Um, Lazio, 30 goals allowed last season, but that was on 41.3 expected goals allowed. You know, they had one of the best defenses in all of Italy last year. That was really the sticking point for them so much mm-hmm. of last season uh, was that defensive record. And uh, it was a very impressive one, not one that I think we expected coming into this season. Uh, I think out of all the, like, the top clubs in Italy, it, Lazio would not have been like my first three guesses, I think, for best defensive uh, you know, record or one of the best defensive records. But uh, they did, and maybe again, maybe my initial intuition would have been correct because this uh, does seem to be maybe just a little bit of an outlier. 41 goals allowed, though, would still be a, a pretty decent number. Um, it wouldn't be necessarily at like the more elite end uh, like this one is, but... Uh, still a decent number, and you know Lazio are an interesting team to to watch this year because they're kind of at a little bit of impasse. Obviously, they lost Malinkovic Savage. He's going to be a hard man to replace. Um, obviously, you know their owner is not necessarily interested in spending tons and tons of money on the team and refurbishing refurbishing the squad. They're going to be in the Champions League. Uh, that's obviously a big haul for them. Um, I, I think this is a team. It sucks that they lost Malinkovic Savage because I think this is a team that if they stuck together and added one or two more pieces. Maybe you could talk about it as like a dark horse for the title type of thing, um, if they if they could get their act together. Um, but I, I I don't really see that on the cards when you look at uh, this potential regression in terms of goals allowed. That also makes me a little concerned. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason they 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 finish so high. They're back in the Champions League. I mean, it's sorry ball. I think that Saudi also can go out and find you know these these players that maybe not everybody's looking at and and but they offer exactly what he needs for his system. Uh, he kind of did that with Napoli. And and you know what? I'm not surprised that that they played this well defensively. I mean, you see the fruits of, you know, what the work that he put in at Napoli, you know, once Spalletti took over because they were still like one of, you know, the top defenses in Serie A. And, and you know, one of the reasons why they won the league uh, this past year. Uh, I don't think it was just solely on their coach. It was the the... Coach who put the building blocks before that. I mean, 
uh, Sarri Ball has always just been very, very defensive. You see, it, he did it when he was at Juventus. He did, he did it now at Lazio. He did it at Napoli. It, he'll find guys, especially losing Milinkovic Savic. That was a was that a free transfer? Or did they get money for that? They got money for that. Yeah, I, I would have thought so. Lolita was not gonna let that slide if it was a free. Um, they haven't used much of that money, have they? No, they have. They've not. Uh, yeah, and that has been, a, I think, a, a source of discontent amongst uh, lots well, of fans. It, it was Luca Romero a free transfer to Milan too? I can't remember. Uh, let me double check that. Um, so for for Linkovic Savage, they got uh, this is in U.S. dollars, uh, forty one million, which is mm-hmm. like it's like in the thirties, uh, somewhere around. Uh, Luco Romero was a free agent, so that was okay. a uh, that was a free signing. Uh, I was going to say, then they have like, I hate using the same, but they have a war chest in in terms of Lazio when it comes if they if they got money for both of them. They got but... they got Tati Castellanos, um, who's okay, uh, you know, former MLS product, played in Spain. I think he was most known. He scored like four goals in a game yeah. uh, last year. Like, let's be real, like that's not uh, that's not one that moves the needle all that much, uh, in my opinion. So. Yeah, they, they haven't made a ton of signings uh, this summer so far. And, uh, well, they're going to need to sign a midfielder, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's uh, stay in Italy. We'll look at Empoli, with uh, 49 goals allowed on 58.3 expected goals allowed. Um, this is right around the threshold where I think you're starting to see something, again, actual regression as, as a possibility, and not just, again, a little bit of noise with expected goals. Um you know, Empoli were an interesting team. You know, we expect them to take a step back last year, and they did. Uh, that was mostly a product of them just losing some talent. You know, it was a team that's not going to be able to recover from that smoothly and transition well. Uh, they finished 14th, which I think, even with understanding that they were probably going to take a step back, I think was still a little bit of a disappointment. Um, you know, I think at times last year they really struggled for a consistency, and I think uh, I'm very curious to see what they do this year. It's hard to tell, you know, with, with uh, Serie A this season in terms of relegation, you know, who could be going down. I'm not sure that I, I believe that Empoli are a real threat for that, but um, is concerning that maybe, you know, uh, defensively they could have been a little bit worse last year. And this is a team that I think is uh, crying out a little bit for, uh, you know, for some investments and, yeah. uh, you know, some, some added talent. And they, they just uh, have not really been able to do that. Um, they got Giassi from, from Spezia. Uh, Ranocchia from Juventus, and they, they have your boy, Daniel Maldini, of course, on loan. Um, it's Giuseppe Pizzella, um, sort of a, a journeyman left back, can play in a little bit of center back type of stuff. Nothing, used to play for Fiorentina, right? Yeah, nothing too inspiring, to be honest. Like, uh, nothing in here that I, I love necessarily, but uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think there's, there's something to be hopeful for, frankly, but. Again, I, I would watch this season uh, on their, their defensive numbers and see if they improve at all. Well, what's funny is that they allowed less goals than they were expected. But the reason they finished so far down the table was they couldn't score goals. I mean, they they only had, I think, 37 goals uh, compared to their 49 allowed. So what's really funny is if you, if you think that they allow more, allow an amount that's closer to their expected goals allowed, this is you're talking about a team that's fighting for their life in relegation, and they were they were sitting pretty comfortably above the relegation zone this year. So, you know, we're talking about these regressions, maybe where they may fall further down the table. They will if they don't address these scoring concerns. Yeah, you, you sign Jassy, that, that that's one thing. But uh, Daniel Maldini is he going to get this done for you? He's more of an He's more of like a winger, or not a winger, but like more of like an attacking midfielder. He's not going to score all the goals for you. So he'll score one goal against Inter, and uh, that's probably yeah, it. yeah, exactly. It's a little, it's it's tough for them. They have to address that offensive end. The defense got it done. They got it done. If they, if you know, if they score closer to forty, you know, 45, 46 goals, they're almost like even when it's their, you know, goals scored and goals allowed. You're seeing a team that could have, you know, been battling with Monza for, for you know, comfortable mid-table. Yeah. Thankfully, in play, we're not really uh, in too much danger last year of relegation. And again, I, I don't really see that on the cards for them this year. But uh, 
would like to see that goal scoring, like you mentioned, maybe get interest mm-hmm. a little bit more, maybe in the midfield too. Last team in Italy, which will also lead into our only player from Italy that can really find that uh, had a, a, a big enough sort of thing. This is a good name, though. Noteworthy. Salerno Town had 48 goals on 36.7 expected goals. Uh, so, again, a pretty sizable overperformance there by about 11 goals, almost 12. Um, this was in large part to their star striker from last year, Buladia. Uh, he had 16 goals last season. That was on 8.8 expected goals. Um, really, really just found a, a, a hot rope last year and, uh, and held onto it. And that was a, that was an impressive goal scoring run for him. He had a, a great season, take nothing away. But I think even in the moment, it felt like maybe this was a little bit of an overperformance, maybe a little bit fluky. Um, and the numbers bear that out. You know, he's almost scoring double his expected goal number, uh, which is a, a little bit surprising and always going to be not easy to replicate. <laughs> let's be real. Um, and to learn a ton, I think without his goals, you know, if you do cut his goals in half, maybe that is a team that's in a much tougher position in terms of the relegation fight um you know and i i think uh, you know that would give me some some pause if I, if i'm looking at sonny tana this year but they haven't sold him have they i know there were rumors of like teams wanting him but he's staying there for another season correct uh they have not sold him uh i i don't know it I haven't heard a, a, a enough about rumors. He was technically on loan last year, so I think he's actually like a Salerno Town player this summer. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I would I, I don't really foresee him leaving. Uh, this I summer. mean, yeah, because I was going to say if if he was their player and uh, they were looking to sell him, that's you know you're talking about this eight goal like if if it's cut in half, right? You're talking about forty goals scored on sixty two goals allowed. That's not good. That is not good at all. They kind of need his goal scoring and then bolster this defense. And and you're looking at a team that could be, you know, safe next season. But you know, I, I don't know where are they getting money from, right? Have they, they're not selling players. They're not buying players, are they? Where, where are they getting a lot of this money from? Uh, I, I think just from, from staying in Syria, I think it's a, their best thing. Yeah, they're not a club that's, that's really uh, known for – having a lot of money or really even selling anyone on you know it's just not really been a, a part of Salernitana's system you know they, they kind of rely a lot on like free agent deals or you know getting uh guys like Kendreva of course right uh you know to, to kind of help them in with some veteran leadership but... Ribery Ribery yeah in years past uh they get Benoit Costil from uh Lille the goalkeeper um that's an interesting uh interesting signing for them as they uh, just spin the wheel again on uh on like <laughs> sort of notable names at goalkeeper yet not totally established. Um, so yeah, Slurney Tana, look out this year. That's all I'll say. Uh, that could be that could be a little bit of a worry uh, if if you're you're focused on them. So those are regression candidates. Those are some teams and some players just to, to, to keep in the back of your mind, uh, and that could have uh, a tougher season than expected uh, this season coming up. I'm gonna hit you with some transfer and news roundup because we do have uh, do have some news to talk about and. Uh, not a ton in terms of transfers, but uh, this one, interesting. Sheffield United, uh, newly promoted to the Premier League, but a familiar face, at least from a few years ago. They did lose and die to Marseille. Uh, he was uh, one of their, their top goal scorers last year. 14 goals, 11 assists in the championship. So this is a big loss for them, um, and they're going to have to do a good job to replace him. Uh, not ideal to be losing him. Uh, also, you know, kind of at this stage in, in, in the preseason, too. Uh, you know, where you maybe felt like you're depending on him a little bit, but uh, definitely a guy who played a lot of minutes, scored goals, was creative, and, uh, you know, now you're going to have to try and replace, uh, you know, 25 goal contributions. That's not an easy thing to do. In a very tough uh, striker market right now. Yes. No, that's that's not just... I wonder with all these teams just making very, very bad, unfortunate decisions. Well, I think uh, he had been rumored with Marseille a while. Like going back to the beginning of summer, I think there was even maybe some kind of like gentleman's agreement that they made mm-hmm. about his uh, about his future. Um, so you know it, it's it's tough, uh, but when you're I think a club on that kind of level, you know you expect to maybe be uh, be losing players and gonna have to you know sort of you know deal with that. Um, but yeah, they they've not done a ton uh, so far in terms of transfers, uh, you know to to maybe address that. So. We'll have to see if Sheffield uh, pull anything out. This one is is big and impactful. Uh, Gabriel Jesus, he's going to miss the start of the season due to knee surgery. 
slightly concerning part here is this is from the same knee that he injured last year uh, and he missed three months in the middle of the season it's just that uh, world cup injury um he's expected did he get surgery then though yes but apparently it was giving him discomfort um this summer uh while they were training and they had to go in and clean it up and arteta said that it's going to be you know he's going to miss a few weeks the season starts next week what is a few weeks no one quite knows, uh, especially if you're into American football. Uh, you know, we always get this this time of year when training camp starts and preseason starts. You have players that get injured and coaches will always say, oh, it's a few weeks, several weeks. And you start to really want to know exactly what they mean when they say a few or several. Uh, but for Gabriel Jesus, I mean, this is potential really big loss for Arsenal uh, at the start of their campaign. Now, of course, yeah. they still have Eddie Nketiah as a number nine. Still a Balogun there as well. Uh, his future doesn't really seem super clear either. Um, obviously, you have Kai Havertz who could theoretically, you know, shift in at number nine. I don't know that that's why they bought him. Even something like Martinelli potentially. Who knows, right? Like, But it's not ideal. It's not an ideal way to start your season, um, especially when they're hoping to be competing for a title. You know, when you yeah. have uh, your kind of preferred starting striker out, you know stayed in the obvious here but not a, not a great way to, to to start the year we're gonna see an arteta false nine i feel like that's how you could utilize kai havertz or even you know odegaard in that aspect where you know you have that he's not really a center forward but you know he's more of like that playmaker and, and you're relying more on the wingers because i mean they have electric wingers they have guys that can score we talked about martinelli already scoring above his expected goals you know last season you know get him the ball and i mean Bukai Osaka you know, he has a, has an eye for goal. So, you know, you talk about Kai Havertz theoretically uh, playing striker, this could be the role for him and, and, and have Odegaard, you know, deeper in the midfield for link up play. Uh, there are, I think, I think there are options where, you know, if you have Gabriel Jesus out, you can, you can kind of work your way around it. It would be obviously nice to have him back, but I think the thing that's a little more important is making sure that that knee is all good because they paid money for him you don't want him to kind of just fall apart and not offer you, you know, any type of service for the remainder of his contract. Yeah. I think that's the concerning part is that it's, it's the same knee and it was sort of a cleanup operation. I don't know. Just always makes it's very concerning. Always makes it something about Brazilian strikers in their knees. It's just, <laughs> it's because it's bad vibes, bad, bad vibes. Um, that's all we got, uh, for, for tonight's show. Um, like I said, we'll be back next week to do a Premier League season preview. We'll be doing like we did last year, where we uh, give like our what we think our top six will be, who we think will win, who we think will get relegated, um, and maybe a few like uh, we'll call some of our shots. Let's call it, you know, uh, you know who we think will be the the. We don't like to do the team by team stuff because you can find that frankly everywhere. I think what most people want to hear is again who's going to win, who's going to be in the Champions League, who's getting relegated. Those are the things I think most people are really looking for. Um, in, uh, in, in season previews so we'll have that next week for you Dom anything to say before we get out of here um, yes I'll be recording the new episode of Fuck Boys tomorrow uh, if you're listening to this you know later than so uh, take a look out for the new one uh, I fell a week behind on it but it's all good I'll be back on it so make sure you guys check that out if you do play you know FIFA or EAFC if you're planning on playing that whatever the EA Sports football title is um, if you play ultimate team and you want to get a little bit more, you want to hear some opinions, you want to get in on the conversation, check it out. Fuck boys. It's on the underground sports, Philadelphia network. You love to see it. You love to hear it. Uh, we'll be back next week and listen, that's right around the corner, baby. You got, you got one more weekend, one more weekend, fill it with whatever you want to do. Cause all the way until May, you're going to be, you can be locked up. My friends, uh, we'll talk to you next week. See ya.